Hi, so you may be one of those people that tries to avoid using pharmaceutical interventions where possible. When it comes to heart disease risk, one of the factors that increases risk generally is an abnormally high level of lipoproteins, which are these cholesterol and fat containing vessels in our body. They serve an important function, but too many are a problem. So how do we make sure that our lipoprotein burden remains low without drugs? Well, I had the distinct honor of having a discussion with Dr. Gil Carvalho on a number of health topics from fasting, causing insulin resistance, uh, what to look out for to improve longevity, and more. And one topic that Dr. Carvalho went into some depth on how to lower our ApoB levels, which is an accurate marker of our overall lipoprotein burden. Gil has a medical doctorate and also earned a PhD in biology, as well as runs an excellent nutrition-focused channel called Nutrition Made Simple. I love his work, and I think you'll love this discussion in its entirety. In this episode, you will hear a brief background on ApoB, how it can contribute to heart disease risk, understanding the problems of clearance and creation, as well as, of course, how to fix it. I'll supply graphics and references as Dr. Carvalho speaks. You can find the references linked to this content. And without further ado, here is Gil. So ApoB is a is a protein. It's short for apolipoprotein B. So apolipoprotein B. Uh, and these are essentially tags that uh, maybe we maybe I should stick it to take a step back and explain what a lipoprotein is, just in case people okay. aren't familiar with that. So these lipids, these fats travel around in our blood, cholesterol, you've heard of cholesterol, you've heard of triglycerides. These things travel around in our blood, but they they don't, oil and water don't mix, right? So they can't travel, like they can't just float around, they would clump up. So they need a vehicle to transport them around. So a, 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 you can imagine a car or a truck or a, a boat, whatever analogy fits, uh, to transport fats back and forth in between our tissues through the, the bloodstream. Um, and so these are the lipoproteins. They're basically spheres of lipo means fat and uh, protein means protein. So lipoproteins are essentially these tiny clumps of protein and fat. They look kind of like microscopic tennis balls. And so the magic there is that the, the parts of the fat that don't connect well, that don't, uh, uh, that don't uh, go along, get along well with, with water, are facing the inside and vice versa. And the proteins and the parts of the the parts of the fat that are polar that do get along with water are facing the outside. So nature came up with this elegant solution to transport our fats around. So there are a number of these lipoproteins, so two main families, and one of those, these families is the ApoB carrying lipoproteins. So they have this tag called the ApoB or lipoprotein B that identifies them. And the reason this is relevant is because it's this family that is atherogenic. Atherogenic just means causes plaque in the arteries. And so uh, atherosclerotic heart disease, cardiovascular disease. The other family is the HDL family, uh, which you've also heard of, and that doesn't cause problems. So uh, that's why we care about ApoB. And then the other thing that's very convenient is that each one of these lipoproteins carries one copy of ApoB. So you can measure the number of ApoB molecules in a unit of blood and count the number of lipoproteins that are present. So that's very, very handy. And uh, just very briefly, uh, decades and decades of research have pointed primarily to the number of these ApoB carrying lipoproteins as the key factor as far as lipids go uh, that is the determinant of cardiovascular risk. So it explains risk better than all of the other metrics. And it's 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 most of the evidence indicates it's the causative factor uh, for the, for plaque to begin. Uh, so that's why we care about it. And that's that's in a nutshell what it is. Okay, that was the background on ApoB. How should we think about it from a clearance and production standpoint? And how can we use non-drug interventions to lower our heart disease risk? Yeah, there's actually a lot uh, at multiple levels. We're very lucky to have many ways to intervene, and a lot of this has been studied. So um, 
I'll start by, by kind of painting the picture the way that uh, Dr. Um, William uh, Cromwell did. We had him on. He's a great lipidologist. And we had him on, and he explained uh, this this increase in ApoB like this. Basically, if your ApoB is too high, if the concentration of those lipoproteins is too high, two things could be going on. You could be producing too many, or you could be clearing too few, right? Or it could be a mix of both. So lucky for us, there is ways to intervene at both of those sides of the equation, the production and the clearance uh, with lifestyle before we even get to the drugs, the prescriptions. So starting with the, the production side, insulin resistance and uh, central adiposity are things that tend to induce uh, ApoB production. They tend to increase it. So people who are insulin resistant tend to have higher ApoB than, than people who are insulin sensitive. And so um, weight loss, or more specifically, loss of fat mass, loss of excess fat mass, uh, tends to improve ApoB levels. Uh, and so another thing that's very interesting is that we, we published another recent video on this. So obviously you can lose weight just by cutting calories. And that does tend to improve ApoB. But exercise, even keeping calories constant and keeping weight constant, can have a pretty substantial effect, effect as well, an additional effect. So we covered a study where they started out with people who were insulin resistant. And just the weight loss with, the, with diet uh, brought down their insulin resistance a lot. So they became 80% more insulin sensitive than at baseline, then half of them exercised on top of the diet, but weight stable and isocaloric, and it doubled the benefit. So it went to 160% more insulin sensitive than the guys that, that had the exercise on top. That actually surprised me, the, the magnitude of that effect. So yeah, those, those can have a substantial effect in improving insulin resistance, reducing adiposity, and improving ApoB. For some people, that's enough. It gets them to where they, they where we need to be, to the healthy range. Sometimes it moves the needle, but it's still too high. If that happens, that's ind indicative that it's a clearance problem on the other end of the, the equation, right? That it's we're probably not producing too many, but we are just not clearing them. We're not getting rid of them. So they accumulate in the bloodstream and the level remains high. And so... There's a number of things you can do on that end. Um, the main factor is probably this, what's called the PS ratio. So the ratio of polyunsaturated fats to saturated fats. And really it's it's any unsaturated fat because monounsaturated has the same effect. It might just be le a little less potent than poly, but they both have this effect. So even mechanistically, saturated fat a diet very high in saturated fat. There's some heterogeneity there. So I'm I'm kind of simplifying this. Not all saturated fatty acids are the same. But in general, a diet very high in saturated fats will tend to reduce the number of LDL receptors on the surface of our liver. And LDL receptors are these little docking stations where the these lipoproteins dock and then they're pulled out of circulation. Uh, so specifically these these ApoB carrying lipoproteins, some more than others, but that's that's the, the gist of it. So a diet very high in saturated fat, less docking stations, these lipoproteins stay in circulation longer, their level goes up. More unsaturated fats, especially poly, the opposite happens. More uh, docking stations on the surface, more lipoproteins being, being pulled out of circulation, the level comes down. Uh, so in terms of some actionable shifts in diet, this would be things like, you know, swapping some of the butter for unsaturated spreads like um, peanut butter or avocado on your toast or something like that. Um, some of the fatty meats go to leaner meats or go to fatty fish. That's another, uh, or some of the bacon also to some fatty fish. That's another productive uh, switch. Uh, if you if you cook in solid fats at room temperature, so lard, coconut oil, these things tend to be higher in saturated fats. 
If you switch to more liquid fats, there are a number of them. People have different tastes. Olive oil, avocado oil, canola oil are some examples uh, with a lot of evidence behind them. Um, nuts and seeds, that's another source of uh, unsaturated fats. So uh, this type of, of, of tweaking uh, tends to reduce ApoB. Uh, other things, uh, even carbohydrate to some extent in some studies, switching from carbohydrates to unsaturated fats can also have this effect because carbohydrates are kind of, kind of neutral. Um, but unless it's in very high amount, in which case they can increase VLDLs, which are a type of ApoB lipoprotein. But in general, uh, switching some, some carb to unsaturated fats can also have this effect of nudging the ApoB down. And then other things that people ask about, dietary cholesterol, common question. People ask if it's uh, if they have high cholesterol or high ApoB because they ate too much cholesterol. Not necessarily. It's a relatively minor factor compared to the ones we've talked about. And it depends on genetics. Some people are, for most people, it's a it's a significant but modest effect of dietary cholesterol. So eating eggs versus not eating eggs is my might affect your LDL cholesterol by like seven points, 10 points in that, in that range. But some people, about 20 to 30% are hyper absorbers of cholesterol. And those people can have a big, uh, big change by modulating dietary cholesterol. So something to bear in mind. And that can reflect in ApoB as well. Um, what else? Uh, fiber, the amount of fiber in the diet, especially soluble fiber can help bring ApoB down. Some sources are uh, oats, barley, eggplant, apples, okra, soluble fibers. If you look up soluble fiber sources, you'll get lists on, on Google. Berries are a good source as well. And then uh, ultra processed foods can have an effect of increasing ApoB. Used to be that trans fats, industrial trans fats were a factor. Now, not so much because they've, they've been kind of discontinued in the US at least. But um, concentrated fructose can have this effect as well. So sodas, sugar-sweetened beverages uh, can have an effect of nudging up people B. So uh, moderating that can help. Soy protein, there are some studies showing that soy protein can help bring down ApoB B as well. Uh, that's it off the top of my head for, for dietary tips and exercise tips. We touched on exercise. And then supplements. I guess fits under the umbrella of uh, of lifestyle. It's not quite. It's a it's a hybrid between lifestyle and prescription meds. It's 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 a limbo. So uh, there are a number of of uh, supplements that have been shown to help lower both cholesterol and it will be the effect is generally modest compared to like a statin or something like that. But it but they can help nudge the numbers a little bit. Red yeast rice can work. Um, psyllium husk can work. It's essentially a fiber supplement. You mix it in, in water and you and you drink it. Uh, so those, those are some examples. There are, there's a couple of other others. Stanols, phytostanols is another another thing out there. Um yeah that's that's essentially that's essentially it. For most people those tweaks can have a substantial effect. And for most people can get them in the in the healthy range. Uh, sometimes people have genetic limitations and are doing everything right. And they're still not there, you know, no shame. It's, it's, we're not all built the same. I have, we have viewers that their lifestyle is like picture perfect. They, they bike miles and miles every day. They eat everything perfect, but it's still too high. And, you know, that's when, uh, the pharmacological tools come in. That's what they're for. No, no shame in, in going that route. That was a tremendous amount of information nicely packed together by Gil. If you'd like a document with everything succinctly put together for you, I'll have one in my free community under the free resources, which is linked in the description of this video. That said, I'll have more content with Dr. Carvalho releasing soon, so stay tuned. But if you'd like to hear more of his work right now, I have his channel linked as well. With that, I hope this was informative and check out this video if you want more on the topic. Bye.